There's no place like home, especially when that home is Zenoscope, your home for everything Zen, where we discuss everything in the Zenoscope universe from Oz to All Guts No Glory, The Musketeers, Van Helsing, and so much more. This is Zenoscope. I'm your host, Mark Sells, and we're so happy you could join us for our April edition of Everything Zen. April happens to be one of the most important months of the year because all of those April showers you hear about, well, they provide much needed moisture for the beautiful flowers and plants to absorb carbon dioxide from the environment and release oxygen for all living things to breathe. I would say that's pretty darn critical. Some say April is named for the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite. But linguistically, the word April comes from the Latin verb aprilis, which means to open, and references the trees, plants, and flowers opening and blooming. So start thinking about what you're going to plant this month, and if you're like me, working on that neglected basement or attic, as April is also a great time for spring cleaning. We celebrate Earth Day on the 22nd, Arbor Day on the 29th, and the Easter Bunny makes an appearance this year on April 17th. On April 11th of 1970, Apollo 13 launched and then suffered a catastrophic explosion hours later that completely crippled the ship. Fortunately, the astronauts were able to make proper repairs and returned home unharmed, and the situation was captured in the 1995 Ron Howard film that lent itself to the often misquoted line, correctly delivered as, Houston, we've had a problem here. On April 15, 1912, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank two hours and 40 minutes later on her first and only voyage and was featured by James Cameron in the 1997 film of the same name, whose heart and runtime went on and on at three hours and 14 minutes. And remember, two decades ago, Heather Burns declared April 25th as the perfect date because it's not too hot, not too cold, all you need is a light jacket. From the 2000 film, Miss Congeniality, starring Sandra Bullock. Coming up on this podcast, Noah Mitchell has some fantastic podcast Word of the Month prizes for you, all focused on Oz, our featured comic series of the month. Amber will be stopping by to share her thoughts on Oz, and will be celebrating a full year of fun facts. We'll be joined by creator and writer of Oz, Patchwork Girl, and the upcoming Oz annual, Dominion of Ozmo, Jenna Lynn Wright. And later, I'm so excited as we launch into the final frontier with legendary guest, Will Wheaton, to discuss his brand new book, Still Just a Geek, and oh so many things to cover, from Star Trek to the Big Bang Theory, and so much more. It's going to be a blast, and it's all coming up next as we move to warp speed on this edition of Everything Zen. No matter how dreary and gray our homes are, we people of flesh and blood would rather live there than in any other country, be it ever so beautiful. There is no place like home. Spoken by Dorothy Gale in L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, published in 1900, chronicling the adventures of a young Kansas farm girl and her dog Toto as they are swept away from their home by a tornado and end up in the magical land of Oz. Upon her arrival in the magical world of Oz, Dorothy takes a yellow brick road en route to the Emerald City to meet with the wizard, who the locals believe can help her get back home. Along the way, she encounters a scarecrow, a tin man, and a cowardly lion, and with her new friends in tow, meets the wizard, who informs her that the only way he can help her is if she brings him the broom of the Wicked Witch of the West. The book was an instant success, reprinted, and turned into a Broadway musical in 1902. So successful was it, Baum created 13 additional Oz books from 1904 to 1920 as sequels to the first story. You had The Emerald City of Oz, The Patchwork Girl of Oz, 
the magic of Oz, all before wrapping up with Glinda of Oz. And you'd have to live under a rock to miss Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow in the classic 1939 film The Wizard of Oz. Oz entered the public domain in 1956 and has since been adapted many times over for film, television, theater, books, and comics. Sam Raimi directed Oz the Great and Powerful in 2013 with James Franco and Mila Kunis. Elton John's album Goodbye Yellow Brick Road found inspiration in Oz. And the Broadway smash hit Wicked was based on the revisionist book by Gregory Maguire called The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West. In July 2013, Xenoscope was swept away to the magical land of Oz with Grim Fairy Tales Presents Oz No. 1. Written by Xenoscope co-founder Joe Brusha, Dorothy finds herself trapped in Oz once more, hunted by armies of deadly warriors, flying monkeys, and demon dogs of the fallen Wicked Witch. Together with the help of Glinda, the Good Witch of Oz, and the Lion Thorn, they seek out a lost weapon known as the Viridian Scepter to free Oz from the Wicked Witch and send Dorothy back home. After a successful six-issue run, Xenoscope returned to the wonderful world of Oz with tales from Oz, Warlord of Oz, Reign of the Witch Queen, No Place Like Home, The Wizard, Heart of Magic, and Age of Darkness. And just last year, released the Oz annual Patchwork Girl. Patchwork Girl writer Jenna Lynn Wright will be here to talk about breaking into the comic industry, her experience with and connection to Oz, what the future holds for Patchwork Girl, and the Dominion of Oz. But before we bring Jenna on, let's check in with Noah to find out what prizes are available if you enter our April podcast Word of the Month contest. Fables, folklore, fairy tales... These are the fundamental foundations for literary fiction. So what better way to celebrate these noble pillars of fantasy than with a podcast raffle? That's right. It's time for Xenoscope's Word of the Month contest. Anybody can compete and anyone can win. In order to play, all you have to do is listen for this sound. When you hear it, we'll reveal a secret word or phrase. Message us at info at zeniscope.com with that secret word or phrase. Be sure to include your name and email address, and you'll automatically be entered into our raffle. This April, our prizes highlight one of the greatest fairy tales of them all. Oz. And no, I'm not talking about the one with Judy Garland. And I'm certainly not talking about the one with J.K. Simmons. No, not at all, no, sir. I'm talking about the action-packed, thrill-filled comic book series that is Xenoscope's Oz. One lucky first-place winner will be selected to receive the Oz hardback graphic novel trilogy, with volumes 1 and 2 featuring exclusive artwork from the New York City Comic Con. Less than 250 were ever made. These rare artifacts, in addition to an Oz-themed metal card set, can be yours. Two second place winners will also be selected to receive Volume 1 of Oz in hardcover format featuring cover artwork by renowned illustrator Art Germ. Additionally, both second place winners will receive an Oz-themed metal card set as well. Finally, a handful of runner-ups will be selected to receive discount codes that can be redeemed on our web store to purchase comic books, art prints, merchandise, and more. Remember, keep an open ear for the rest of this podcast and listen for that secret word or phrase. One, a two, and now Mark, back to you! Our first guest this month is Jenna Lynn Wright. A screenwriter, comic writer, and author, Jenna first cracked into the industry with co-writer John Rocco and their big screen psychological thriller, Ambition. Since then, she's continued writing for film projects while simultaneously authoring titles for Xenoscope, such as Grim Tales of Terror, Grim Universe Presents, Myths and Legends, and of course, Oz. Jenna joins us now to talk about all things in the magical realm, reimagining L. Frank Baum's work, horror films and the influences of John Carpenter, and what's in store for this year's Oz Annual. We have entered the creator spotlight for Everything Zen, where we are joined by Jenna Lynn Wright. Jenna, happy to have you with us here on Everything Zen. Thank you so much for having me. As you know, comic book writing is such a niche. 
how did you start professionally as a writer? And specifically, how did you break into the comic book business? I started writing, I started out in screenwriting, actually. Um, and I have been doing that for, uh, I want to say, a little over 10 years. Um, most of my work is done with a writing partner. And I kind of, he had started writing before me. And I learned the ropes through him. And then, um, he, I mean, we've, we've had a bunch of stuff in development. We had a film actually made. And so through that, um, I had started to look into comic books as well, because one of my former jobs was a book scout for a movie studio. And I would nice. go to conventions and go to tables and see what was out there for potential, uh, the dreaded word IP, right, for adaptation. Right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that kind of started my interest when I saw how cool and how there was just no budget in comics and you could do whatever you wanted. And um, I actually met my, I started out as a friend, now fiance, is a comic book creator, uh, kind of like a whole, he's the whole shebang. He does art, he does writing, he does coloring, he does lettering. And um, he's the one who came at me with kind of this encyclopedic knowledge of comic books. And I learned a lot through him. And I found out that comics were a lot more than superheroes. There were all of these worlds you could jump into. And I really became interested in that. And I read comics, I read books. Um, uh, I also hate the word networking, but you kind of meet people in the industry. And through one of those people, um, I came there. I came into Zenoscope's um, view, and they seemed to like what I do. And then I landed uh, the first job was an Oz book. It was a uh, Patchwork Girl, and then things just kind of steamrolled from there. Did you have favorite comic books growing up? And if so, you know which ones inspired you? What inspires you today? Uh, when I was growing up, we were, I wish we'd been a comic book household. We were more of like just a novel household. So I didn't really, I came into comics late. I didn't get into comics um, until I want to say when I had that job, which was in my mid twenties. Um, and I tended to gravitate a lot more toward creator owned or image type stuff. Um, I wasn't really into the big two. I've gotten more into them as I've been in the comic book space. Um, but some of my favorite ones that I read early um, was a lot of Scott Snyder stuff. It was witches. It was wake. Anything spooky, really. I'm drawn to like the horror side of things. <laughs> um, uh, I think the thing that I've really enjoyed the most lately, even though it's uh, the run is over, was Cy Spurrier's run on Constantine. I'm a huge fan of Constantine. I like Daredevil. I... Uh, one of the older ones that I read that I really dug in that universe was Typhoid Mary. Um, oh, yeah. She was a lot of fun. So yeah, anything that's a little bit spooky and a little bit left of center is probably for me. So I'm guessing that spookiness probably carries over into your favorite films, television series, and books. What are you mm -hmm. enjoying right now or have over the past year? Over the past year, uh, one of the really nice things that we've gotten during the pandemic was a subscription to the, uh, the shutter channel, which is an offshoot of AMC and all they do is play horror movies. So I've gotten a bit of an education there. My all time favorite is Halloween all time. Uh, How can you go wrong with John I've, Carpenter? You really can't. He's the best. Um, some things that I've really enjoyed over the past couple of years. Uh, there was a horror movie about vampires called bliss a uh, spooky movie called The Night House, which is one of the first movies I've seen in a long time where I didn't see the end coming. Like I, Because I, when you write them for so long, you kind of can pick out how things are going to happen. I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, and I really enjoyed, uh, gosh, I loved Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I know that's not a horror movie, but that's something in another genre that I dug. Um, different kind of horror. Yeah. Different, <laughs> yeah, different kind of horror. One that... I like that they got their happy ending in that movie, you know, as opposed right. to the actual reality, which is just terrible. Well, we've got you here uh, with us to talk about Oz at Zenoscope. Oz, of course, yeah. emanating from the great Oz himself, L. Frank Baum. Mm -hmm. For most of us, our initiation into Oz was from the 1939 musical starring Judy Garland. What was your initiation like? And what do you remember about your first Oz encounter? 
Mine was also the, the Judy Garland version. I remember being so blown away from the black and white to the color transition in the movie. Because you start out watching it one way and you're like, okay, this is the movie. And then this technicolor world comes into view. And I find that actually a lot of the stuff that I write now that I make up in my own head has a lot to do with you're in a normal world and then you go into a kind of heightened reality or technicolor or something like that. So maybe, maybe Oz has more of an impact on me than I originally thought. <laughs> uh, but that was, I think, the thing that, that swept me up at first. What do you like most about the land of Oz? I, you know, to be completely shallow about it, and I know this isn't really the land of Oz, but I was always a huge fan of the Ruby Slippers. I'm a huge fan of, like, <laughs> like, I don't want to say the, the fashion, but like, I, I loved, um, I love uh, magical realism. Like, I love uh, things that are not quite reality, but are still based in reality. So you've got your villages, you've got your castles, you, it's, you know, almost if you think of it kind of, um, old school, uh, like England with all the, the castles and whatnot. You don't really have castles in America. So it's kind of magical. And then here's this, this woman with these great shoes and these quirky friends. <laughs> she's just, she's trying to make magic happen. And I really like that. <laughs> you could have said the great Oz himself. You could have said the flying monkeys, the yellow no. brick road. You chose. The I like the wicked best. witches. The Wicked Witches. Okay. L. Frank Baum, by the way, considers The Patchwork Girl of Oz to be one of the two best books of his entire career. And cool. Scraps is one of the most popular characters. What was it that made her ripe for reinvention and as an evil character at that? When I was envisioning Patch, it was less about the fact that she was evil and more about the fact that her circumstances transformed her into something that she might've had a, a spark for in the beginning, but it was really the cruelty of other people that led her to become what she was. And I always think that that's very interesting when you can tap into what people might have inside of them, like maybe their dark side a little bit and just take it to a, extreme because you can do that in comics and it was really kind of a commentary on how people's misperceptions turn someone into the thing that they're accused of being because they accused her of being a witch and she wasn't a witch and then when she went through this trauma and ended up in Oz and all of that stuff she's like well if they're going to call me a witch and I didn't do anything wrong maybe I'll just go be a witch so that was what was fascinating about Patch to me is like this villain with a very I feel like a lot of them have tragic origin stories and maybe she didn't have to be this way, but other people pushed her into it. Yeah. It's a characterization that good, good and evil are not, you know, one or the other. There's a lot of shades of gray in between. In fact, it's, yeah. it, it sounds very similar to wicked, the story of Alfaba and how she was also sort of misconstrued and misperceived and she wasn't born wicked. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It was her life circumstances that, that changed her into that. And that's just, I mean, that's most people is not that you're going to be wicked or evil or anything, but most people are shades of gray. Nobody's just good or bad. Right. So. I got a little sense of a zombie vibe <laughs> going on, but what were, what were your inspirations behind the story and the ragdoll powers? The ragdoll powers really just came from um, a lot of that was the the guys at Xenoscope. They had a lot of great ideas about kind of what they wanted to do with uh, Patch and what she was able to do. And it just seemed to make a lot of sense that if she's made out of the stitchwork kind of quilt, what then in her arsenal could be used to change people or get her agenda out or whatever that is. And there was just something really creepy about the visual of sending these threads out and, and using them to basically poison the people that she comes across and then make she she went from having someone else trigger her into being evil to then her taking that and triggering everyone else into these terrible dolls and it was just it's kind of like the lineage of you hurt me so I'm gonna hurt the next person and then they're gonna go hurt the next person and um, there's something really interesting to me about that 
as a writer reimagining Baum's work, how important is it to capture his style and aesthetic? You're obviously taking the characters and stories in a different direction, but do you feel mm -hmm. obligated to his voice? And if so, what specifically is important to maintain? I didn't really feel obligated to maintain anything in his voice because I feel like, well, paying respect to the original, if you're going to take characters and do something new with them, there's always going to be the original. You can always go back to the original and experience that the way you want. And what is cool to me about reimagining this stuff is getting to take things in a new direction with familiar faces. Um, and so hopefully it may have a bit of what he intended, but for the most part, it was trying to make a completely new thing within the structure that he set up, I feel like. Will we see more of Patchwork Girl in the future? I hope so. I don't know, but I hope so. If we, if we are, come to me. Zenoscope, come back to me. <laughs> I would love to write her again. I thought she was a blast. What do you like most about working with Zenoscope? They have treated me so well. It's been such a pleasure to work. Um, I first started working with Dave Francini, and then now uh, my main editor is David Wall. And they're so responsive when I have a question. If I'm like, listen, should I be reading some backstory for this? They'll get me the, the PDFs I need to read for all of that. Um, and it's always like instantaneous. They work, I feel like they work 24-7 to get this stuff going. And so it's just really nice as someone who works in businesses where sometimes there can be dead air for days, if not weeks, um, having a team that's like, let us help you every step of the way to make this story the coolest it can be is really great. And Amber's great too. I've loved chatting with Amber as well. In addition to Patchwork Girl, you've got another Oz assignment that I hear of in the form of Dominion of Osmo without yeah. spoilers. What can you tell us or tease us about the upcoming Oz Annual? Uh, I can tell you that Dorothy is going to learn a bit about her history that may have been hinted at before, but now you're going to get some more information. They are also going to travel to a new land that they did not realize existed, which was fun because we got to, to play a lot with that. And, um, there is a, there's always a horror tinge to things with me. Um, there's always a pretty juicy villain, and uh, they get into a lot of a lot of uh, tricky situations that are a lot of fun to get them out of. So I can say that. Jenna, thank you so much for stopping by and writing such amazing stories for us. We'll be looking forward to Dominion and many more things down the road from you, down the yellow. Thank brick you so much road. for the great down the yellow brick road in my fancy red shoes. <laughs> That's right. Just watch out for flying Monkeys. houses and tornadoes. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. If you'd like to learn more about Oz, stop by Zenoscope.com today, and midway down the homepage, you'll see a section entitled Oz 101. It's got Tales from Oz, The Wizard, Patchwork Girl, Heart of Magic, everything you need on your journey down the yellow brick road. In almost the 17 years of Xenoscope's existence, there have been some truly terrifying villains. We've had Van Helsing fight many, many monsters, including Dracula, the Mummy, Frankenstein. We've had some terrifying emotional demons fought by Robin Hood. And I don't know if you guys read a little series called the wonderland universe but uh the mad hatter will pretty much keep you up at night in the recent year there has only been one character that has absolutely shook me to my core and that was the patchwork girl the Oz Annual, written by Jenna Lynn Wright was perhaps one of the scariest villains I've ever heard of can you imagine you're probably thinking patchwork Quilt, a Raggedy Ann doll. Okay, has anybody ever heard of Annabelle? <laughs> what about a doll that turns you into a doll? And no, not just like a cute doll, but a doll where when you get turned into the doll, you are suffocating by fluff. Um, I don't know about you, but that sounds 
horrifying. Oz Annual, The Patchwork Girl, came out last year and has three absolutely blown away covers by Igor Vitorino, Ivan Nunez, Harvey Tolobeo, Ula Moss, and David Nakayama. This horrifying, horrifying story is $7.99 right in our web store right now. The synopsis reads, Dorothy, a character that obviously you know very well, was once a farm girl from Kansas, but has been many since years since then, and it's been even longer since she returned to Earth. Now residing as the Queen of Oz, ruler of the Emerald City, she and her people have gone through their hardships, but she has been there to protect them. But when a magical tornado rips through a prison, bringing one of the most evil creatures to ever walk among in Oz to a town in our world, Dorothy and her friends must set out to protect a place she once called home. And what she will find will change the very fabric of her identity. Introducing a horrifying new character, the Patchwork Girl, in this super-sized 64-page tale that cannot be missed. All I'm saying is that you would be heartless, brainless, and, I won't lie, courageless not to read this. This is a patched-together sensational story for its character's first appearance. Get it at Zenoscope.com right now. That's the sound of our podcast Word of the Month. And for April, we're clicking our heels and going with Dorothy's canine sidekick, Toto. The April podcast Word of the Month is Toto. Moving forward now, let's take a look at some of the exciting events coming up on the Zenoscope calendar for April 2022. New releases drop every Wednesday, and it's a jam-packed month of exciting new books. With the conclusion of All Guts No Glory's three-part miniseries, we've got Van Helsing racing against time and attempting to heal old wounds and shattered soul, a return of Dracula's daughter in Grim Universe Presents, a new grim Tales of Terror quarterly that dives into the deep seas and the mysteries of the Sea of Souls. And the month wraps up with Sky uncovering evil secrets in a steampunk world in Grim Fairy Tales Volume 2, Number 59. And as discussed earlier with our featured writer guest, Jenna Lynn Wright, a brand new Oz annual entitled The Dominion of Ozmo. Starting on April 15th, every order on Zenoscope.com will receive an Easter Egg Hunt scratch-off ticket. And get this, each scratch-off ticket is an instant winner. You could win a limited edition metal book, a metal card set, graphic novels or art prints, and one lucky winner will get a 24 karat gold coin and NFT pack valued at over $5,000. I don't know if we've ever done anything this big before, the Easter Bunny is coming, coming to Zenoscope this month. The new metal comic, metal cards, and sticker set have all been released for April and are available for subscription on Zenoscope.com, along with the new 2022 Collectors Club editions for board game cosplay and catch them throughout the month. Are you a fan of Peeps? The marshmallow treats that are always popular this time of year? If so, you'll love the holiday collectible by Josh Burns. The sugary sweet LE375 releases on Easter Sunday, April 17th. Our April featured artist of the month is none other than Elias Chad Zudis. Not only will you find all kinds of new art prints, stickers, and metal cards in Elias's collection on Zenoscope.com, but the second of Elias's series of Wonderland steampunk collectibles releases on Wonderland Wednesday, April 20th. They say what happens in Vegas stays in Las Vegas, but if you're not there with us on April 22nd and 23rd, you just might miss out. This is the last call for our VIP event at the Mirage Hotel and Casino. Whether you're a current VIP or would like to become one, you can purchase a ticket online and join our artists, writers, staff, and special guests for an unforgettable event hosted by Zenoscope. Along with Zenoscope staff, we've got artists Nii Rafino, Sun Kumanaki, Eric Basildua, Keith Garvey, and many more. That's April 22nd and 23rd in Las Vegas, 
Visit Zenoscope.com and look for VIP and VIP events under the main menu. Or send a quick email to Noah at VIP at Zenoscope.com. Our featured guest this month is one of the most well-known and respected names in science fiction and fantasy. Comic book conventions, pop culture expos, and geek forums all around the world. And that's because he is Will Wheaton. You know him as Wesley Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation, Gordy Lachance in the classic coming-of-age drama Stand By Me, he played a fictionalized version of himself on the CBS hit series, The Big Bang Theory, and has lent his voice to so many animated shows and audiobooks, we've completely lost count. An incredible body of work that includes Family Guy, Teen Titans, Guardians of the Galaxy, Batman, Legion of Superheroes, and Ready Player One and Two, just to scratch the surface. Outside of acting, Will is an avid poker player, Dungeons and Dragons aficionado, video gamer, podcast host, LA Kings fan, comic book writer, and active blogger on WillWheaton.net. His latest work is an annotated memoir, Still Just a Geek, in which he revisits his 2004 collection of blog posts, Just a Geek. Releasing this month, the book is a raw, insightful, and inspiring story about Will's struggles with depression, his personal challenges with family, acting, and love, and finding fulfillment and passion in all aspects of life. I had the pleasure of speaking with the stellar Southern California native to talk about his early life and acting experiences, comic books, Star Trek, working with Mark Hamill, Time traveling back to those early years in preparation for Still Just a Geek. Here's what Will had to say. Well, I, for one, cannot believe we are sitting here with the one and only Will Wheaton. Will, welcome to Everything Zen. Hi, thanks so much for having me. We're here to talk about Still Just a Geek, an updated, annotated version of your 2004 memoir, Just a Geek, what makes this book unique and different from its predecessor? When Just a Geek was written in 2004, I was almost 30, and I was kind of looking back on my teenage years and what being part of Star Trek and a young, early kind of first-wave blogger meant to me um, as I was also settling into my relatively new life as a husband and a dad. Still Just a Geek is what happened when I opened that book up for the first time in 20 years as an almost 50-year-old, looked back at almost 30-year-old me, saw things I liked, things I was appalled by, things that I had thought were incredibly important that I had completely forgotten about. And most importantly, I saw how much I had changed as a person and as a writer and I had a lot of thoughts about those changes. I had places where I thought I was very hard on myself 20 years ago. I had places where I saw that I wasn't entirely honest with myself and readers 20 years ago. And I addressed all of it in what turns out to be extensive annotations. A good way to think about just a geek and still just a geek uh, is like we're sitting down. I've got the original book, Just a Geek, in my hands. I'm reading it to you. And every now and then I sort of look up from it and reflect on what I've just read from 20 years ago. That's the experience of the book if I've done it right. If you could travel back in time, what advice or guidance would you give your younger self? It's such a difficult question to ask because I, I went through a lot. I, I suffered a lot. Um, I struggled a lot. And as a consequence of all of that, as a result of everything that the 20-something version of myself uh, survived, I have an amazing life now. I love everything about my life. I am so happy. I am so grateful. Um, I just, I, I, I cannot say enough incredibly good things about how wonderful my life is. If I don't know if I would listen to myself, <laughs> I don't know how much credibility 20-year-old me would give 50-year-old me. But, um, you know, when I look back 
uh, over the last 20 years of my life. It seems to be around the time that I was like 30, 32, 33, somewhere around there. I kind of realized that much of my life was a lie, that I never wanted to be an actor. I never wanted to be famous. I don't like attention from people I don't know. And that since I was seven years old, my my mother had kind of forced me to be the actor she wanted to be. She wanted to be the stage mother of a famous actor and, and, and benefit from everything that comes along with that. So when I was seven, she made that choice for me and, ch- and decided that I was going to do that. And for the remainder of my childhood, when I said, please let me be a kid, please let me be a kid. I don't want to do this anymore. She would manipulate me and gaslight me, make me feel guilty, tell me that she had given up her career so that I could have a career. Because, you know, when a kid's seven, that's a thing they do. And when I really, really, really recognized that, when I, I had to confront in my early 30s, my, I'm not a, I am not a child to my mother. I'm a thing. Um, she loves me, but she loves me the way a girl loves her dolls. And the man who was my father never loved me, doesn't like me at all, and has made that very clear. And nothing I will ever do will ever be good enough for him. Nothing I can do will ever change these two things. I realized all of this when I was in my very early 30s, right after Just a Geek was, was written. And it was so painful and so difficult to deal with that I just basically became a drunk instead of dealing with the trauma. And uh, in 2016, uh, my wife was like, I'm super worried about you. And I agreed, decided to stop drinking. And that began this incredible healing journey where I really did have to confront the things that were, that were painful and traumatic, and I couldn't hide from it anymore. I had to process and work through PTSD from childhood abuse and trauma, um, from emotional neglect, emotional and physical abuse from the man who was my father. I had to work through all of that. If I could go back and give my younger self any advice at all, and I just don't know if I would listen to it, it would be, dude... When you have this realization, it hurts and it is terrible. And diving into the bottom of the deepest well of alcohol you can find to avoid it is not going to do anything to make that pain go away. It's actually going to make your life a lot worse. And every day, it seems, for the last couple of years, I've been talking with my wife about a revelation I had and how I acted on it and how some particular part of my trauma was healed and how I've recovered from certain things and how I wish I had done it when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I recognized a few days ago that when I say I wish I had done this when I was younger, what I actually mean is I wish I had confronted this and found the strength and support from my friends to, to confront the reality of my trauma and uh, and heal it instead of trying to avoid it. I wasted 10 years of my life just getting drunk and avoiding it. And I regret that. I'm sad about that. Um, I'm great now. Everything is cool. I'm really happy about it. I feel really, really good about my life. But if I could just be like, dude, here's the thing that like you just don't need to do to yourself, it would be that. But all the other things, you know, the like, would you have quit Star Trek? Would you have said yes to this movie or no to that movie? Would you have done, gone to this place or, you know, all of those things, every single one of those choices has rippled out in a way that has butterfly affected me to where I am right now. Um, so I wouldn't change any of those things. It's just that big block of time in my life where I was just like, I'm in so much pain, I'm going to avoid it. I wish that I had not done that. Right. And a lot of people probably have similar experiences growing up. Turning toward our listeners out there and readers of Still Just a Geek, what do you hope they take away from your experiences? That we're allowed to change. That we are allowed to make mistakes when we're younger and learn and grow from them. And when we look back on the things that we said or did that we aren't proud of, um, that you know, we may have a reaction along a continuum from like, 
mild embarrassment to absolute revulsion, that's terrific. It means that we've changed. It means that we've grown and changed, and that's wonderful, and that it is okay to make mistakes so long as we own them, learn from them, and grow to be better people uh, as a result of, of, of learning from them. Mm. I also hope that anyone who has ever felt like they haven't been given the opportunity to pursue their own dream for whatever reason, for everyone who has felt like I have been pushed onto a path that I never wanted to be on. You don't have to stay on it. I learned that. It was really hard. It took me until my life was nearly halfway over to realize that. So if somebody can figure that out 20 or so years before I did, you just get to live a longer life where you're being really happy. And, and, and I, just, I just hope that my fellow trauma survivors – my my fellow travelers in the in the delightful world of mental illness will feel seen, will feel uh, validated, and will feel less alone because that's the way I feel whenever anybody reads any of my work and says to me, "Oh man, I saw some of myself in what you said." Mm. On a on a lighter note, long before Stranger Things, there was Stand by Me, without a doubt, yeah. one of the greatest coming of age films of all time. When was the last time you watched the film and has your perspective on it changed over the years? I haven't seen it in a while. Um, I think the last time I actually watched it from start to finish was with Rob Reiner and Corey Feldman for one of the DVD releases. We watched it and did a full length feature commentary about it. Um, I have seen Jerry O'Connell quite a bit over the last year or so. Um, I host the Ready Room for Paramount Plus, which is the online hub to uh, all things in the Star Trek universe. Jerry is a voice actor on Star Trek uh, Lower Decks, and I've had the great privilege of interviewing him a number of times. Um, uh, I just did his show, The Talk, to promote Still Just a Geek. It was good to see him again. Rob Reiner recorded a message for us telling us how much he loves us and how proud of us he is. That was unbelievably cool. But the viewing of Stand By Me that I think has been most consequential in my entire life would have been in the neighborhood of 15 to 18 years ago when my then stepchildren, who are now my adopted children, were probably like 12 and 10 or so. Uh-huh. Uh, we sat down and watched it together. And for them to see me when I was their age telling a story about people who are their age was real interesting for me. Um, Stand By Me is a very different movie for an adult to watch than it is for a kid to watch. Uh, It communicates two very different stories. And seeing it as an adult um, opened my eyes to a lot of things about myself that I hadn't been aware of. Mm. You co-wrote the comic, The Guild Fox, back in 2012. I did. Yeah. What did you enjoy about that experience? And would you consider Uh, writing more comic books in the future? Yes, I absolutely would. I would love to. I'm actually talking with somebody right now in the hopes that we can make a thing come together. I don't know if it'll happen, but they've got the pitch and we'll see where it goes. Um, I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. And it's so interesting to me that you bring it up because I just came across some old blog entries from 2012. And one of them is this comprehensive essay on how I wrote it and, wow. uh, and the, the, the creative process and, uh, and how Felicia and I worked together and what each of us brought creatively to the table. And um, it was a wonderful memory to, to have. I'm, I'm, it's so interesting to me. As I have spent all this time with Just a Geek and Still Just a Geek, I've spent a great deal of time with myself when I was in my uh, uh, late 20s. And I have since, uh, in the last couple of weeks, been spending all this time with me when I was in my late 30s. And we're two really different people. When I'm in my late 30s, my career is kind of going the way I want it to go. I feel a lot more comfortable with myself. I, I'm doing things that I really like. And um, my writing's really different. Uh, it's just it's more relaxed, it's more conversational, and it's just interesting and weird to me to see how much I had changed from just like 28 to 38, 
And I hadn't actually kind of put all that stuff together until just the last few days when I started rereading stuff from around that era. It is just the weirdest coincidence that you brought up Fox right now because I literally was looking at that like two hours ago. We're on the same wavelength, Will. <laughs> I guess so. You've narrated dozens of audiobooks, uh, the Ernest Klein books and The Martian being some of my personal favorites. Oh, what thanks. What do you enjoy about performing narration? I love to read. Um, I have been a reader my entire life. When I was a kid, I just loved losing myself in these other worlds. It was a, a really great way to get away from the reality of, of my life. As I got older and read more and more and more, as I spent more time learning how to be an actor and a performer, my personal reading for pleasure began to c convert in my head into like a radio play. Oh, yeah. uh, I could hear the character voices. I could really see the scenery. I could feel the emotion of the characters. I don't know if that's the way other people read, but that's the way that I read. Mm -hmm. And narrating for audio lets me have the privilege of taking what happens inside my head when I read for pleasure and sharing it with another person in a way that I guess people like because they keep asking me to come back and do more. Um, it, lets me it lets me combine two things that I genuinely love. I love telling a story. I absolutely love it, whether it's mine or somebody else's. I absolutely love it. The, the tradition of human beings sitting together and listening to someone take them on some kind of journey, whatever that journey may be, is so beautiful and wonderful and timeless. And I love that I have the privilege um, uh, to have a spot in that continuum of storytellers uh, in my work as an audiobook narrator. I, I just absolutely love it. And you narrated Still Just a Geek as well. But if I did. you couldn't narrate Still Just a Geek, who would you want to be the voice of Will Wheaton and why? Uh, you know, honestly, uh, I, I would not choose anyone else to do that. Uh, an, an enormous part of my personal story an enormous part of Just a Geek and Still Just a Geek is that my entire life, uh, I didn't have the, the fundamental human right of my own voice speaking for me. Somebody else was always speaking for me. The reason I started my blog in 2000 was because I was so fed up with... Uh, uh, an entire lifetime of being coached by my mom to tell this story to publicists, to tell this story to the teen magazines, to go along with the lie, to be the, the, the product she was selling to fund her lifestyle. And I just got really tired of that. It, I, I, I needed to it's almost like I needed to have this primal scream that was like, I am a person. And I started out with a blog and still just a geek is at this moment, sort of a one of what I think will be more than a couple of culminations of all that work um, and, and all that effort that I put in. And there are people I love. There are friends who I adore. There are people who I, I absolutely cherish, who I think are magnificent. If they were to tell my story, something would absolutely be lost. And I know that because when I wrote my story down, when I wrote Still Just a Geek, um, which in the annotations, I talk about the single most traumatizing event in my entire life. Um, I talk about things that are deeply personal and wonderful and deeply personal and, and, and terrible. When I wrote it, I was hoping that I would find some kind of catharsis that uh, uh, would be part of this journey of healing all of the trauma I experienced as a child and, and well into my 20s. I didn't get that as a writer. I got it as a narrator. It all happened when I narrated the book. It was, it, was, it was unexpected. It was very surprising. It was extremely emotional. And, uh, and it all came out. So I know that the writing of it and the telling of it are two very different things. And I, I have heard from uh, professional psychologists and professional psychotherapists that 
that is a, a, a reality of therapy. I don't know what it is, but writing things down does one thing. Saying them out loud does something more that is typically more profound than the writing. And that was my experience. In, in 2017, you wrote a short story for the Star Wars anthology from a certain point of view. I did. I loved and, that. And of course, there's a long running feud or competition, whatever you want to call it, between the two. As a fan of everything geek, what do you like about Star Wars more than Star Trek and vice versa? Um, Star Wars is space fantasy. Uh, the Force is magic. Um, uh, the Jedi are wizards. Um, I love that about Star Wars. I also saw Star Wars in 1977 when I was five. Like, it made an incredible impression on me. I grew up playing with Star Wars figures until the late 80s. Like, it was just an enormous part of my life. I absolutely despise the prequels, and I, and I am not a fan of the current uh, releases uh, after Rogue One. That said, for other people who love them, awesome. I'm thrilled that you love them. Everybody gets to like their thing their own way. And the idea that you have to choose Star Wars or Star Trek is ridiculous to me. I've, I've, I've rejected that my whole life. I remember being a, I remember being a kid and, 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 and there was always someone, it was rarely another kid. It was usually an, an older person trying to get us to like stand in a box, right? Like, are you, are you in the Star Wars box, or the Star Trek box? And I was like, how about if I'm in the, I'm a nerd and love science fiction box? Like, that's great. The thing that I absolutely love about Star Trek that is very, very different from Star Wars. Star Wars is escapist entertainment, and I, and I, and I adore it. I cherish it. Star Trek is super inspiring. Star Trek tells morality plays. Star Trek very subtly illustrates and supports and inspires diversity, tolerance, um, collaboration, working together, the value of every person's existence that is inherent to them, regardless of their race, their gender, their species, all that. Star Trek says all of that. Star Trek is maybe the most progressive, most forward-looking, uh, most inspiring science fiction in the history of science fiction. And it, that makes it, in, in that case, very, very different um, from Star Wars. I love them both. They are absolutely not in a competition with, uh, with one another. And, uh, and I know that there's a lot more in the Star Wars world, huge extended, extended universe stuff that I've just never paid attention to. So I apologize, Star Wars nerds. I love you. I just don't love it the same way you do. <laughs> I will tell you that that story I wrote for From a Certain Point of View, yeah. I got an email from their editor. Do you want to write a thing? And I said, yeah, I'd absolutely love to. And the way I remember it, the editor was like, awesome. Unfortunately, the book's really filling up. So you can't really get to, you can only have like, around 5,000 words or something like that. I was like, okay, I think I know what to do. And in 2017, we were at the beginning of Donald Trump's fascist nightmare. And uh, I was thinking a lot about collaborators and people who know better, who just kind of go along with the empire, uh, who are stand-ins for fascists in the Star Wars universe, and what that kind of meant. Um, and it was one of those examples of writing fiction to process and address and kind of deal with something awful happening in real life, which is one of those things I think science fiction does really, really well. Different subject here, but you were in so many great episodes of The Big Bang Theory. You had the Wesley Kahn episode, the Wesley Crusher's <laughs> bowling competition, the serial yeah. apist, and who could forget yeah. the Sheldon Amy wedding. What was yeah. your favorite memory or moment from the series? Gosh, there's so, so many. I was talking in yesterday about how it's real hard for me to do ranked lists yeah. because I tend to put, I tend to put things into like these five things were super amazing. <laughs> and like, I don't, it's so hard to pick a single one. Um, I don't know what my absolute favorite thing is, but I will tell you a story about working on the Big Bang Theory that I believe will be amusing to you. It's about the episode with the wedding. So the way we do production, um, uh, we come in Wednesday morning at uh, 10 o'clock and we sit around a law. Uh, they, they push uh, like six long, skinny, 
banquet tables together to make one giant table. And around that table, about 40 people sit around that table. Writers, executives, networks, people, studio people, and all of us actors from the show. I have always sat in one particular seat that is across from Jim, next to Kunal, and next to Simon. That's where I've always sat. Kind of like Sheldon himself. I, I guess so, yeah. So on this particular morning, I come in to do the table read, and it's for the wedding episode. And we all know that Mark Hamill is coming to be in the stage that day. All of us know that. And as I go, go into the stage, Nikki Laurie, who is one of the assistant directors, she also directed many episodes. She's amazing. Nikki was assistant directing on that episode, and she says, uh, I moved your seat this morning. And I said, oh, did I do something wrong? And she says, no, I just moved your seat because I thought you would prefer to sit in this other chair today. And I was like, oh, okay. So I go and take my new seat, which is on the opposite end of the table, on the opposite side of the table from where I usually sit. There's an empty seat next to my chair. And in front of that is a nameplate that says Mark Hamill. Hmm. Nikki walks over and says, yeah, uh, I just sat you next to Mark Hamill. I just thought you'd like that. And I was like, um, well, Nikki, you're getting a gift basket this Hanukkah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Mark Hamill comes in <laughs> and like, oh, my God, I'm sitting next to Mark Hamill. I, I can't believe this is happening. We're rehearsing the thing. We get to the scene where Mark Hamill and Will Wheaton meet each other. And Will Wheaton says something like, oh, you're the guy they got to replace me. I'm Will Wheaton. Uh, I'm Will Wheaton. And Mark Hamill goes, I'm sorry, who are you? <laughs> it's a really <laughs> funny bit in the show. So we get to that part of the scene. And Mark, who is sitting next to me, says, I'm sorry, who are you? The entire room explodes into laughter. It's a funny line. It's, the delivery is really funny. Before the next line can be said, Mark sits up in his chair, holds up both of his hands in that everybody stop and pay attention to me kind of gesture. And he says, I want everyone to know. And he looks at me, Mark Hamill looks me in the face and he says, of course I know who you are. Of oh. course I know who you are. I am a huge fan. And I was like, ah! I just, I just, my, like I, every computer meltdown lockup, crash screen that you've ever seen in your life is what went on in my head. I just wow. completely shut down and had to do a full reboot to continue on with the thing. Um, Mark didn't have to do that. I don't believe he would have said it if it weren't true. And the thing about him that I love, and the reason this comes up, uh, this particular story is if you're of a particular generation, you know, there's like, there are people in that generation, our entertainers that were real important to us. And if you have the opportunity to encounter that person, you kind of hope they'll be a particular way. You hope they don't let you down. When Adam West worked on Big Bang Theory, he was exactly who we wanted him to be. Bob Newhart was the same way. It was just like, oh, you're legends who have done this forever. Do you want to tell stories about things? Awesome. I will sit down and just shut up and listen to you. And I got to do that, man. I got to sit down and listen to like Bob Newhart talk about being on TV in the 60s. I could listen to Adam West talk about making Batman. Like, come on, what are you talking about? This is amazing. <laughs> so um, the thing about Mark Hamill is that he is exactly who you want him to be. He could not have been just more perfect and kind and generous and genuine and enthusiastic and lovely and wonderful. And, uh, and that was a gift that he gave every single one of us on set that day. I love that. My last question for you, with all that you've accomplished, where does Will boldly go next? What inspires you and what's on your bucket list? For the first time in my life, I really know what I want to do as the next thing in my creative career. And it's my choice. It's my work. It's my focus. I haven't really experienced that before. I've had experiences in my life where I've thought, well, I hope this happens. Or, you know, maybe I audition for this thing and it comes down. Or maybe I, you know, have this idea to make a thing and it kind of comes together. Um, but it's always been with the sense of like, I hope it's not taken away from me. I hope somebody doesn't tell me I can't do this before it's finished. I've spent a lot of my life 
just trying to figure out who I am, trying to find out what my identity is, what's important to me. I couldn't do that until I very sadly and regretfully had to just end contact with my parents because they would not let me be me. I had to be the thing. And now that I am me, what I see in, in, my, in my future, in my near future anyway, is this other book I want to write. Just this other thing, this idea that I had one night and I wrote down some notes and I thought about it. And then the next day I thought about it and wrote down some notes and I did that for a couple of months until all of a sudden I have this folder full of notes and I think I kind of have a way to maybe turn it into a book. And the thing about that is like, what's exciting for me is I don't care if it gets published or not. I just want to write it. I just want to do it because it's going to be creatively and emotionally satisfying for me. And when I recognized that, I realized, holy shit, I'm a writer. That is what I am. Because for someone who really wants to be an actor, I mean, who just loves it, who loves it the way that my friends who have wanted it their whole lives. Uh, I, I grew up with Seth Green. We're still really, really good friends. He talks about how he knew when he was like, eight years old. I want to be an entertainer. I want to make people laugh. I want to make people cry. I want to be an actor. He knew and he's pursued it his whole life. People like that don't care if they do a play and there's two people in the audience. It's the doing of the play that matters, not the success of it, not the audience. What was presented to me as my dream was a lie. I was turned into a tool that was exploited and used by my mother to go after her dream that she would have done for free. It was never my dream to do for free, ever. So if I did it, if I did acting, if I did a play, if I did a thing, I didn't do it because I loved it. I did it because like, oh, it's important that this is successful because if it's successful, then my mother will finally be happy and maybe this is the thing that will, that will like make my dad love me. And when I gave all of that up, I was able to say yes to a couple of small acting projects where the character was interesting and the work would be fun. And I didn't care what happened with it. And it allowed me to just start writing things all the time and just not care what, what goes on with it. I had this amazing moment recently where I was like looking at kind of like social media statistics and I was looking at Google um, uh, rankings and all that stuff. And when I wrote Just a Geek 20 years ago, I was like in the top 10 on just about everything. And the stakes were extremely high. And right now, I don't think I'm even in the top 100 anywhere. And it's great because it allows me to just be honest and vulnerable and direct and frank and say the things that really matter for me, knowing that people who want to hear those things and who want to engage with me are going to do it. I don't carry around that baggage anymore that that was placed on my shoulders, which was from my mom, make everybody like you because then they'll like me and my dad which was nothing you ever do is good enough for me. And I was like, well, I'll show you. Both of those things are just completely gone. And I'm just doing things that I really love, that I'm really happy about, that I really enjoy, that are deeply creatively satisfying. And I'm excited about it. Well, we are too. We're very excited that you found your true self, your writing. Thank you so much, Will, for joining us here on Everything Zen. We're not just fans, we're geeks too. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed our conversation and thank you for your kind words about my work. Still Just a Geek by Harper Collins is available now on Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble, and at most online and brick and mortar booksellers. Also, if you'd like to hear Will narrate, you're in luck because Will has narrated Still Just a Geek as well, and it's available on Audible for download right now. For Star Trek fans, especially all of the new series on Paramount+, Plus, you need to be watching The Ready Room, as Will hosts the show and discusses Star Trek Picard, Lower Decks, Prodigy, and Discovery with all of your favorite Star Trek cast and crew. 
You can watch all episodes of The Ready Room on Paramount Plus's YouTube channel and catch all seven seasons of Star Trek The Next Generation streaming today on Paramount Plus. Before we wrap up this edition of Everything Zen, let's check back in with Amber to see what fun facts she has in store for us for April 2022. Hiya friends, fun facts guru Amber here. It has been a full year of fun facts and a full year of highlighting badass females. For this special edition of fun facts, I will be highlighting a badass city female that everybody knows, Las Vegas, and specifically highlighting fun facts around our Las Vegas event taking place April 23rd, aka later this month. Some fun events that we will be hosting are bingo, Zenoscope Squares, Q&As with your favorite creators, maybe a scavenger hunt, and some friendly quote-unquote competition for Van Helsing versus Werewolf. If you've never seen the V-Cons, you know that I won't actually play because maybe I like to stir things up, but it will be a lot, a lot of fun. We'll also be hosting plenty of giveaways, selling some extremely rare collectibles, and doing a brushes bargains on site from items in our vault. This event will be hosted at the Mirage, which is one of the most luxurious hotels in all of Vegas on the Strip. Join the staff for a fun happy hour the night before on April 22nd and an after party happening shortly after the event on April 23rd. This event will feature a few badass females, including myself, our marketing coordinator, Casey, past Zenoscope cosplay winner, Rebecca Ross, and two of Zenoscope's most popular artists, Sun Kumanaki and Nii Rafino. It will also include the men of Zenoscope who support badass females, aka the largest shared universe in all of comics, largest shared female universe in all of comics, let me specify there. And that will include the publishing team of Dave Francini, David Wall, co-founders Ralph Tedesco and Joe Brescia, and two incredible artists, Keith Garvey and Ebass. Plus, we'll have some on-site CGC grading. So come join the company that was meant to host an event in Sin City. See you guys there. And that'll do it for this edition of Everything Zen. A very special thanks to Amber, Noah, Oz author, Jenna Lynn Wright, and our featured guest, Will Wheaton. I'm your host, Mark Sells. Thank you for listening. If you're unfamiliar with Wheaton's Law, it's pretty simple. Don't be a dick. Instead, be honest, be kind, be honorable, work hard, and always be awesome. Great axioms to live by from our featured guest, Will Wheaton. We'll see you all again next month, right here on Everything Zen.